Good morning. Today we're going to be taking a look at uh, a topic that uh, anybody or everybody is affected by. There is nobody that will escape what we're going to be looking at here in just a moment. Temptation, good or bad? Let's take a look at uh, James 1 verse 12. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. After, afterward, they will receive a crowd or a crown of life that God has promised to those who love Him. Temptation is something that uh, uh, many uh, I've heard in conversation that they wish that it wasn't there. That it was something that we didn't need to, to have happen. And somehow in, in our thinking, and we're not getting it from the Word, we're just getting it from, from common sense or lack of common sense maybe, I don't know. Uh, but we seem to think that the more mature that we get, the less that we will have a problem with temptation, less that we will be tempted. Well, we know that that's not true. We know and if we talked face to face, you would agree that, that maturity, uh, if anything, magnifies temptation. It, it not magnifies it to us, but it makes it more likely to happen. And this is the reasoning that I'm coming from. Jesus was tempted. He went out into the wilderness. He fasted and prayed for 40 days and then he was taken directly from that scenario out into the wilderness or into the desert or wherever you want to look at it and he was tempted. Well, if temptation gets less with maturity, um, we're in trouble. <clears throat> Jesus was the most mature of anybody that was living here on this, this earth and says that he was tempted in every way that we were and yet remained sinless. So temptation is not something that just uh, immature people would get. Now it happens to all and I would certainly think that I would want to be in the, the comfort of Christ, be, be a Christian and be more mature but if you weren't, if you was one of those uh, if there's even such a place to be a fence rider or somewhere in there, um, does the Lord or does Satan even have to tempt those as much? If we're certainly not living for the Lord as closely as we need to be, Satan's not going to rattle your cage with temptation. He's going to just let you go on your merry way blindly and hope that that is enough. Now, if you would happen to get on the right track and head in, in the direction, of, he could throw in something that would trip you up again. But temptation that we're talking about here today, and mostly what we're, is for people that are living for the Lord, you're never going to get away from temptation. You cannot, in the Bible, we somehow, I've heard people say this too, uh, you need to resist temptation. No, you don't resist temptation. If there's any resisting done, it's against Satan. We, the, James tells us further into the James here that if we resist Satan and stick to, to that, he will flee from you. Temptation, <laughs> if we resist it, we're, we're spending more energies thinking about it and that's where temptation takes root. That's where Satan is able to work on us. It's in our thoughts. That is the beginning of a temptation. The thoughts comes into our mind. So we can't escape it. There is no way that we can uh, do it. Every temptation is an opportunity to do good or to do the right thing, 
to be above, to not fall into the trap that Satan is planning in the temptation. It's every one that you get, every time that you're tempted, it's an opportunity to do the right thing and grow. Which, in that regard, if we follow that prescription, we do what it says, it's good, it's awesome. Now, I'm with you today, I would rather not have to deal with temptation, but to get to the place where God wants us to get, there has to be temptation. There has to be a way for us to, to exercise what we're learning and what we're gaining so that we can become more mature. Growth. That has to happen. Temptation are there. there that's why it's, we said it's every opportunity. In that same breath, for Satan, temptation is his primary weapon to destroy you. It is his primary means to, to get us, to knock us down, to destroy our walk with the Lord. So in one hand, God's using it to make us grow, and it's also the greatest weapon, the primary weapon that Satan's using to take us down. So it's a fine line, it's going to happen, and it's the choices is, are there. God is using it for our primary way of growth. If you think about how you grow, fighting these temptations, battling them, is going to cause us to, to grow. Just like uh, our plants and trees that are in the, out in the fields and the woods, they grow deeper roots and stronger roots when the wind blows against them. If the tree never had any wind against it, it probably wouldn't take a huge windstorm to knock a tree down. The roots wouldn't grow down in very deep, only enough to stabilize it and keep it standing somewhat straight. But it's the wind and the weather that comes against the tree that has it anchor itself deeper. That's the same thing that happens in our walk with the Lord. When we have resistance in the form of temptation, trying to stay above that, stay, stay away from uh, falling into the trap of that, we, we have to sink in spiritual roots down deep into the ground in our life so that we can stand against it. I think you'll agree that, that our job here now is to become like Christ. And when you think of becoming like Christ, what do we look at? What is the thing that we need to be to become like Christ? And I think you'll find that in, in Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 22. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus was perfect love, perfect peace, perfect joy, perfect, all of those fruits, Jesus is a prime example of what that looks like in, when it's lived out in, a, in, a, in the world. Jesus is what we're trying to become like. And if we look at his life, we need to try to, to get to that place. So Satan is going to come in, and if you look just above that in Galatians, you'll see you know, Galatians 5, uh, maybe 19 to 20 or something in there, it tells Basically, I, for all practical purpose, I call it the fruit of, of the flesh, the things that the flesh wants to do. And so we have a contrast with what Satan's trying to do in our life, what the flesh wants to do, and then what God wants us to do in the fruit of the Spirit. So Satan, it, we've known and seen here that he is using temptation to try to destroy us and keep us from becoming like Christ. To becoming love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all those things he's trying to stop us from doing, and he does that through tempting us. Now, if we're loving the Lord and living for the Lord, there's a pretty good chance that we're going to 
try to do the right the right thing. Now, the problem is when we don't recognize what Satan's trying to do to us. If we don't see his what he's trying to do, he can do something that kind of fouls us up, gets us off guard, out of off balance, in the heat of the moment. You people have said, I did this, I don't normally do something like that, but in the heat of the moment, I lost my temper. In the heat of the moment, I did something that I shouldn't have done. Well, Satan is, he's happy with trying to throw something into our life. All of a sudden, he doesn't warn us, I'm going to tempt you, so get braced for it. No, it's going to be a, a broadside slam. Uh, we're going to get hit when we least expect it, maybe. And, and there, there it is. We're in the midst of a temptation. And Satan wants to use it to destroy us. God wants us to use it to grow and to mature. That's where it's at. How does this work? How does that process of being tempted turn into something positive? How does that make us grow? I don't know why. We, I think we know it on paper, but to live it out, we, we like to go to the place of least resistance, place of least persecution, least. The best, easiest effort for us is where we want to end up. And the flesh likes that. The flesh doesn't like the wind blowing against it. The flesh likes calmness and peace and all the things that go along with that. However, does that happen very often? Very seldom do we ever run into a place like that. And then ask yourself, if we were always in a place of, of peace, would we know for sure that we have attained the character of Christ in peace without testing? So it's my estimation here is that Jesus is our example, and let's go with the beginning of this here. He's love. He's perfect love. In fact, the Bible says that that God is love, and if we know that God is love, then Jesus is his son, and he is part of that same thing. So Jesus is love. And he, has, he portrayed that uh, multiple times, and especially over the past couple weeks uh, of, of his life there when he had to deal with the uh, coming into Jerusalem with being victorious and, and uh, triumphant only to find opposition the next day, maybe even further that day yet. Jesus was perfect love. And he had to deal with that all through his, his walk here on life. So here's what God does. He says, you need to become like my son in love. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put you in the midst of unlovely people. And then you'll have the choice to become like Christ or you can battle it and you can fight the unlovely people and you can you'll, you'll just not learn that characteristic that we want you to learn in love so we'll spend our life only loving people that love us and we haven't got love when that happens we have not attained what Christ was trying to show us same thing with joy Joy only is going to come when we're given the opportunity to have sorrow. So this is like a uh, in-school training thing here. Uh, we learn all about all these different subjects and so forth. And how do we know that we've learned it? Well, the school takes a test every now and then. They have a chapter test and then they have unit tests and, and then at the very end of the whole school year they do a whole a bigger test that sees if we learned anything over the past year. Well God is, and, and for us we want to know if we're making progress in becoming like Christ. 
So we are tested so that to see if we have joy, we have to deal with sorrow. In some form of that, we're going to be dealing with problems of, of, of such as sorrow. In all of these characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit in Christ that we see, and we want those, the opposite of, of all of these, such as you know, again, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, thank, or faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We don't know if we have those traits unless God puts in our path the opposite. Well, God doesn't have to be the one that actually puts it there. He knows Satan's going to put it there, so he's going to use what Satan's trying to do to turn it into something good. And it reminds me of the scripture that we talk about. Those that are intending for bad, I'm going to use it for good for you. So that's what it is for the Christian. That, that's, that's what can happen. That's why when I started this, I said every temptation is an opportunity to do the right thing and to become stronger, to more mature. And that's the way it works. There is no way that somebody could boast about being faithful unless they were put in situations that they could be unfaithful. We know that life is full of opportunities like this. And, and this is my estimation, the better we're doing, the more we're growing, the more Satan is throwing in everything that he can in the form of a temptation to us to get us to trip up, to get us to do the wrong thing instead of the right thing. And so there we have uh, the problem. It takes the very opposite of these fruit of the Spirit to get us to learn what they are. Patience. People say, I'm patient. Well, you are or you're not. Patience is one of those things that I have a hard time praying for and want because somehow I know that to get that patience, I'm going to have to go through a lot of things that's going to test my, my patience. One of them has been happening over the last six or eight weeks here with, with Teresa. More so probably with her than me, but it's been rough on me to see hope, to see things get better, and to want her to get to where she can walk and be able to come back to church and teach and get up here and lead worship. Not that we're rushing to do that because Shirley's doing an awesome job, thankfully, and we got people filling in. That's just God's church doing what they're supposed to do. That's good. However, for Teresa and I, God is testing our patience and faithfulness and a number of other things, kindness and, <laughs> and all of these things go. Uh, you need all those things to see this thing unfold. It's hard for somebody that's praying for somebody to see signs of improvement and then it's almost like it's a, you know, and hopefully the humps and the high points get higher than the valley, you know, eventually here. And, and I see hope. Teresa just asked me yesterday. We were sitting around on the porch for the first time with this nice weather and in the evening and she said, do you think I'm ever going to get to be able to walk? And I said, my goodness, yes, I think you're going to. I said, look, just transport your thinking back here about five, six weeks and see what you was doing then and now. Well, she says, well, I know I'm going pretty good on the walker, but what did doctors tell you? He said, we go like crazy on the walker. When you get to the end of the walker, we get a cane. And then the walking comes after that without a cane. So I said, yes, you're, you're gaining ground unless something comes, is thrown into the mix of things again. You're headed in the right direction. And at the end of this, if we continue to have faith that God is working for her good and working it out to where she'll be able to maneuver and, and do things again, at the end of that, she'll have faith and we'll have patience more. And, and along the way, you need kindness and so forth to work with, with some of the things that don't go our way. 
But that's what it's all about. Let's take a look here now at what temptation, how does it work? How does temptation work? Satan, I want us to look at this right off up, up front. I said it's helpful for us to see what Satan's up to. Satan is predictable. He doesn't change much from the garden scenario with Adam and Eve. Satan is not like God. He is not a God with multitudes of variety and uniqueness and he doesn't come up with a plan for Vic and one for Punk and one, he might use some different things but basically he uses the same things that he's used for these many years, the whole, from the beginning of creation until now. His goal is to destroy people. He has his toolbox or tackle box full of, of temptations that, that have worked over the years and he's going to go to those. The only thing that Satan does is he knows what worked before for me. So he's a, in that regard he's kind of sharp. He knows what worked for Vic. He knows what worked for me. So I'm not going to use anything else. I know that some people can't handle this temptation or they, they think about it. It's hard to get through. It's an area of our, our weakest area that we have. The one that we have the most struggle of lining up with, with Christ. And so Satan has known that, not because he's, he's all-knowing, but he knows what worked. He knows what has tripped us up in the past. And he will use those over and over again. He doesn't do them day by day necessarily. He'll, he'll do like he did with Jesus. He'll hit them with these things, and then it says that he'll come back at a more opportune time later. But what he's saying is that the opportune time is not for Jesus. The opportune time is for him. When he thinks that somebody's at their weakest point, he'll come and attack. I don't know about you, but uh, when I was, I seen some of these uh, Easter Christmas or Easter uh, TV specials. And I think it was especially the one uh, the, with, uh, what's the Mel Gibson one? The one that we were just, the passion. The passion. Yeah, I just escaped there. Uh, during that time, you'll see clips during the whole thing with Jesus in the midst of his ministry and doing some things. And, and then all of a sudden, you'll see this little guy come into the scene and he'll try to proposition Jesus into doing something. And he was assessing, okay, Jesus is now going through some very, very trying times right now and maybe he's weaker and maybe I can, I can get him to give in to some of this. Now that would have been victory over victory if they could have, if Satan could have tempted Jesus to, to do the wrong thing. What would have that meant for us? We would have been setting ducks, you know. We, could, we would have been like at a carnival, you know, and that thing just keeps going around until they pick them all off. That's what we would have been like. But Jesus held his ground and he stayed true and faithful. In all of these fruit of the Spirit, he stayed true to God, the Father. He came for a purpose, he did the purpose, and Satan, although he tried many times along the way to get him, he couldn't. That's what will happen to us. Satan knew what works. He uses those things at the right time in our life to, to get for his, for, to do what he's trying to do. And the Bible is very clear, his plan. He, he came to destroy. That was his job. Jesus came to heal and to, to save. Satan came to do the opposite. And so he does that. We put more credit on the Satan. We give him more power than he has. If we don't tell him that we're having a problem in certain areas, he doesn't know. So he's got to experiment with temptations out of his many lures and many play things and schemes that he has in there. So. Satan is predictable. That's good. 
for us to know what he has done in the past, he's going to try to do again. There's a pattern to temptation that is always the same. And it's in the scripture. It's in a James 1, 14 and 15, if you want to turn and look at that. I'm not going to read that. Uh, well, I may read that, but I, it's there. I'm going to share something about it first. It, the pattern is first desire, which is thought. We can't do anything about coming, passing thoughts. They come into our life. Now, the second thing that happens is doubt. Doubt comes after the desire. The doubt is Satan whispering in our ear saying to us, um, did he really say that? Is that what God meant when he said that? Are you sinning if you did that? No. What did he do to Adam and Eve? He said, God didn't say that. Will you surely die? No, you're going to become more like God. He doesn't want you. You're going to have the knowledge of, of, of good and evil. You're going to know. You're going to be like God. Well, he's putting thoughts in the, into our minds, into Adam's mind and, and Eve's. Like, wow, wait a minute. God's withholding from us. And, and it gets them looking like God's not the good guy. He's, he's, he doesn't want us to eat from that tree because that's going to, it's going to make us like him. Was there any truth in what, Adam, what Satan was saying? Yeah, just a little bit. A little bit. We will know the difference between right and wrong after we've ate from that tree. After we sin, yeah. Are we going to be like God? Not really. <laughs> Only in one regard. So Satan is good at telling partial truths at best. Mostly, you can bank on what he's saying as it's a complete lie because the scriptures and other places tell us he's the father of lies. He is the one that if you're looking up lying in the, in the dictionary, his picture would probably be beside him. That's, he is a liar. He is there to ruin us, not to help us. He never does anything that's going to help us follow the Lord. He's going to do only those things that help us to fall deeper into the pit. He doesn't want us to be able to survive and come back out of any of that. So that's kind of where uh, this is working. The, sec the third thing that happens in this progression from a, from a temptation until the end of, uh, until we give in to it, deception is the next one. It's similar to the doubt, but it's a little carried a little deeper. He's got us hooked, and now he's, he's setting it further into it. And then the final, uh, the final one, the final step in, in temptation is disobedience. And if we want to call it disobedience, I just want to call it what it is, sin, so that we have a clear picture of what, what's happening here. The end of temptation is sin, which if you look at what that says in the Bible about that, is we're separated from God. Actually, death, if sin is not corrected. If we die in that sinful, disobedient place, we're dead. We're dead spiritually, uh, which is even a greater, a worse scenario than being dead physically. We can be dead physically and still be saved spiritually, which is the most important thing. But to be doubly dead is, is horrible, and we're totally separated. We should never blame God for temptation. God is not the one that tempts us. James is real clear about this, that we are enticed by our own lustful desires. And when we start playing on our lustful desires, those thoughts that are in my head that I ought to have that, or I need this, or I want more power, or you know, and I can have that if I just do this. If we follow those thoughts, that, that's, that's that flesh working on us. 
we can't blame God, who can we blame? Us. Because we know that Satan's trying to kill us, destroy us, take us away from God, and God wants us to go, and so here's life, and we choose Satan, how can we blame God? We can't. It's not God's fault. God will help us. God will work with us. And to, let me read James 1, 4, 14 and 15 here to show us a little bit about how this, this works. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entices and drags us away. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. That's, the, that's Satan's plan in a nutshell. That's what he wants for us. He wants to show us something that our flesh is so excited about that our fleshly desire drags us away from what God wants us to do. And, and I would, over the years, I've seen Satan tempt me and I gave in and he dragged me. It was almost like somebody kicking and screaming I wanted to do the right thing, but I was going to do the wrong thing because my flesh was so desirous of that. It's not something, ah, I don't know if I want an ice cream today. We can wait till tomorrow. No, this is something urgent. This is something that, that, that your, your flesh, the, and when it gets into the, these desires of our flesh, you know, we have food and we have uh, sexual drives, we have power drives. We have all these different things that are very appealing to the flesh. And Satan has hooked us and he drags us and at the end of that is death. When, it, when it's allowed to grow and mature all the way to the end, it's death. That's where, that's where temptation will end if we give in to it. Now, before you lose hope, and, and, and I'm pretty sure that everybody in here today has dealt with, with temptation, and I would probably guess that some of us have not come out of it without sin. I confess that multiple times over the years I have done the wrong thing. Some of them have been at a spur of the moment kind of things where somebody has said something. It's been the day that my truck blew up and, and the rig wouldn't do this and I couldn't, you know, and, I, and all of a sudden somebody comes against you and you just snap. It's a legitimate from the world's perspective, I have every right to, to blow up and just explode on that individual. But in God's, if we're trying to become like Christ, there is no place in my life where I can get so caught blindsided that I can explode on somebody and destroy their life. That's not Christ-like. I'm not like Christ when I, when I spew hate and, and anything else that I can throw at him at that point, that's not, that's not productive. So in that sense, I've failed that test, that temptation that was thrown at me, I failed. There's times when I shamefully have said, I know better than you, God. I'm going to follow this temptation. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to listen to you and, and the sound reasoning and, and we get caught up in, in the furthering of this, this temptation. We're not quite to the end here, but I want to interject this so that we don't lose it. It's not the end of the world if we have failed at one of these temptations along the way, because all of us in here probably have failed. God is bigger than Satan. There's a scripture in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 that tells us greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So it tells me that God's bigger than Satan. The Holy Spirit is in us, and he's much bigger and more powerful than anything that Satan can do to me. So I already have the access to, to win, and I also have the access for God to say, you're asking me for forgiveness, and I'm going to freely give it to you. So we can start this process over again. It is my desire that you don't do it over and over and over again because we get less and less able to resist when we have 
we, when Satan comes in and whispers in our ear, you know if I throw that lure out in front of you, you're going to grab it. You're going to take it. Because I know you've always done it. This is the 15th time that you've failed at this one process. And I'm going to keep on throwing them. And you're at the end, you're not going to be in the right place at the right time, and you're going to go to hell. He's trying to destroy us. He is, wants to do that. That's where he's at. But God is bigger and has the last word. We can ask him to forgive us, and, and we can get it right. And we can get the power. Satan, once again, when he starts whispering in your ear, just call him, you get out of here, you lie. You're lying to me. You never tell the truth. He doesn't like that. And when we, in the name of Jesus, tell him to get and hit the road, he's got he's to go. He can't mess with us at that point. How can we win over temptation? We've, we've heard that, that it happens to everybody. Uh, there's a, one of my favorite verses about temptation is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It's a long verse. It says a lot. But it's all good. No temptation has seized you except what is common to, to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And here's the good part. If that wasn't good enough. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. This is another reason we can't blame God. Some will say, well, God said it. there's no temptation that I can't stand. So they put their their hat on and their jacket and they run right out into the fire and think that they're going to be okay because God said there's nothing that we can't do. So anything can happen. God's going to be bigger. He's going to help me to overcome any of that. No, he taught us a lot. In that last verse there, it says that but he, with that temptation, he's going to provide a way out. Now, when we get ready for that temptation, when it hits us, you can look in front of you, and whatever you need to get out, to get away from this, it could be a pair of Nike sneakers, it could be uh, the Bible, it could be this, it could be that, and he'll say, put them on and run. Get out of here. We're not to resist temptation, but running, this is about the only time that running is viable. You can't run from God. It doesn't pay to run from a bear unless somebody slower than you is behind you. There, there's things you can't get away from. You can't run away from yourself and your troubles because when you get there, you find yourself there and the problems. But temptation, it's a situational thing. And we're dealing with somebody that's not God that's bringing this stuff. So he's enticing us in a physical way. So if you get away from that temptation far enough, you, it can't get you. So running might be one of the ways that God wants you to get out of there. The other way might be the way Jesus did it when he was tempted. He knew the word so well that when Satan lied to him, he says, this isn't the way it is, really. We don't live on bread alone. So these stones here, I turn them into bread. That's not, I live on God, my Father. He showed him the power and all that. And every time that he was tested, he hammered back at Satan this is how it is, by the word. Satan, after the four that we see in there, he decided, we, I better leave him and work on somebody else and we'll come back later with you. So that's what he did. That's, that's what that scripture is saying. But it tells me that I'm no different than any other human that's ever lived. I'm no different, actually, in, in respect that Jesus had to go through all this himself, too. So there isn't any temptation out there that's, that I'm going to come up against that's not going to be already been worked out and planned. Every man and woman and child, teenager, everybody has had to deal with the, all these. So when you're tempted, it's common. It's nothing special. It's just one of his old tricks that he has, which we know that, and that helps us 
to know that Satan just does the same old things over and over again so that we can be planned and we can at least know what to look for. And if you're weak in an area, you might as well know that you better guard that area and, and not do that. So when you look out here, he might say, uh, here's an alternate route. I could go straight and get there quicker and Satan would be the guy on your shoulder telling, don't go way out around, just go straight through here. And he knows that the, if you, if you uh, uh, have a problem with alcohol and he can get you to walk by the bar and some of your buddies are sitting in there watching out the window and the door, hey, come on in here and have one with me. You know, if he was over here out, out of the way like God made the plan for, you're free from that. And maybe one day you could go by there, but why would you want to? I mean, unless you're going in there to save somebody. I, you know, you get those guys that say, well, I, I was only in there because I wanted to win them to the Lord. Well, you might do that, but how, what's the chances of winning somebody to the Lord in a bar? I, I mean, they're in there for one, I mean, you could go down that route if you wanted, you know, and, and you could say the same thing, oh, I just went into that prostitute. I'm, I was really, my whole agenda was to save her. Well, yeah, okay, you could say that, but God knows our heart. He knows what's best for us. So temptation is there. Don't, if we're weak and we're having trouble, he'll give us a way out. Use it. Why don't we, aren't we successful with defeating and overcoming say, temptation more? Probably the first and biggest one that I can think of is that we raise our hand to God and say, I got this. We've done this a couple of times. I know by now. I'm strong enough to handle that. And so we won't let God help us. We don't have the scripture waiting to, to hammer Satan. We, we're going to go through it. I'm strong. I'm mature. I'm, you know. Well, are you? Or are you just saying that? We don't ask God. He says, ask for help. Immediately. There's, I read here this week, there's a guy that said, he calls these immediate prayers, when we're faced with a blindsided temptation, call them shotgun prayers. You don't have time to, to, to go into all kinds of different theories about prayer and how your weather doing and how's this and no we're uh, help me father to be strong and come and help me right now that's a, that's a prayer that is viable it's good and we need those and we use those we come to the Lord quick he won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we can stand now there might be a, a temptation that Satan wants to use on you and, and this would be a rare thing that you are not prepared for, that you would no way stand under it, and God knows it, and he's going to protect you. He's, he's, he is the way out. He's going to make it like people have said, I was on my road, and I, 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 uh, lo and behold, I, I was late for this, and, and a tree fell across the road in front of me, and I, we, I had to turn around and go a completely different way. That would be maybe God keeping you from the temptation that, that you couldn't have stood against you couldn't have stood against it. So there are times when God just himself will say, here it is. So our pride could keep us from being victorious in temptation because we think we're hotter than, than we are. We are not that powerful. We are not a match for temptation without God. You're gonna lose eventually it will always happen. Temptation is stronger than we are without Christ. That's why a Christian has a little, quite an advantage here because we have all kinds of, of tools and helpful things that will keep us from giving into temptation. The more we use them, the more we learn them, the more we use them, the stronger we become. Satan will work on you only if it's successful. He'll quit, he'll come back and try it again. Then he has to come up with a new plan for you because that one you've 
you have outgrown that one. You have grown with the Lord. You know, like Jesus knew, that we don't live on bread alone. We don't test the Lord, our God, by throwing ourselves off of the top of a mountain and say, God, you're going to catch me. You, you could. Or we could take what Peter or Mark said at the end of his, that you're going to trip on serpents and or scorpions and handle snakes and all that, and they won't hurt you. But that doesn't mean we go out and do that. That's if we're in the middle of our ministry and we come against dangerous things, unexpected things, like Paul did when he was gathering sticks to put on the fire after his coming ashore on the island of Malta. A snake grabbed him by the hand. He didn't go looking for snakes. He wasn't going to say, God, I'm, I know that if this snake bites me, you're going to keep me alive. God would have said to him, you're, you're, you don't have very much common sense. You, we are not testing God. We're not to test God. In the middle of normal activity, we're protected by him. Satan will try to get us. God wants us to win. The only way that we're going to win on a regular basis is to know the word, to not be afraid to go to the Lord and say, I need help again. If we do all these things that he has prepared for us and then to have the common sense to know, this tore me down once, so I better not go knock on the door and see if you want to come out and play. So I'm going to go a different way. We'll go a different way. We don't go to where the sin has got us before. Let's just maneuver across. Let's not tamper with that. Sin gets us when we handle it. If we don't handle it, we come out of it a lot better. That's what God is telling us. Be wise. Be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Don't use, use common sense. It will go a long way toward keeping us from falling into these temptations. God is the awesome God. Temptation is there. We cannot avoid it, but we can beat it with God's help. And the good thing is we become more mature and grow every time that we've met Satan, the temptation, and defeated it. We're stronger. The next time he's going to have to do something a little bit more flashy, a little bit more to get us to do it. And then pretty soon that we won't be bothered with that one. Doesn't mean temptation's gone. It just means right now we've survived, we're stronger, and we're headed down the road to heaven. If we don't battle this and win, if we don't become like Christ, which I'm not saying that next week you, you defeat this, you're going to be just like Christ. No, we got to become like Christ and we're in the process of becoming like Christ our entire time that we're here. I don't think we're ever going to be totally as good as what Christ was. We're not going to be as quite as effective, but we are coming like him. We know the scripture tells us that we need to be striving to be like him. And so we keep trying, we keep defeating, and we keep... You know, once in a while we get beat up and we fail, but we get up and go again, and next time we're, we're a little wiser, we go to the Lord quicker, and, and we, we come out of it better. So you're going to be tempted, and the more you're tempted, take it as a, um, a compliment from God. Only the mature, the maturest, are going to get God has, Satan has the ones that have failed already. He's not going to rattle their cage and say, hey, I'm going to bring you some more temptation. I'm going to get you deeper into the pit. You know, you're in the pit. You're in the pit. He doesn't need to mess with you. But if you're on the other side of that, he's going to keep pulling you until he tries to get you down where you're destroyed completely. So keep on, keep that in mind to know that, that you need help. You need help. It wouldn't hurt to have a Christian brother to support you. 
to help you, and you can help them, and the two of you can do better. The scriptures are clear about that, too, that two are better than one when it comes to staying away from, from the downfalls and the pits of life. Temptation would certainly fit into that. A rope of three strands or two strands is better. So the more the merrier, but we need somebody, but if you can't find somebody, you got a friend in Jesus. You have a friend in God. He will guide you, he will help you, and he can give you, for sure, honest, truthful, and he's faithful, and he won't let you be tested beyond what you can handle. That tells me that when I fail at a temptation, I didn't have my right perspective. I didn't see, I, I, I probably stepped over what God was using to help me. So look for the ways when you come up against temptation, the first thing that ought to come to the Christian's mind is how is God going to help me to get through this? Am I going to just turn and walk away because the Bible says you don't test God, you don't live on bread alone, you know, we know the word. We can defeat Satan by his lie. We can just say, here's the truth, and, and give him the truth, and then walk away without giving any thought. We fail because we don't see what God uses to get us out of our temptation, or over it, around it, under it, or whatever. And sometimes through it, but rarely is it that way. Usually it's, he gives us an escape so that we, we can go. Let's close in prayer. Father, we just love you today. We thank you for everything that you have done in our life, what you are continuing to do. And I pray that we'll take this passages of scripture that we've looked at today in James and in uh, Corinthians and 1 John and, and take all these things at heart so that we can know best how to serve you, how to uh, um, get past these temptations so that we start to look and act more like your son Jesus. That's what it's all about. That's what we're trying to do. And, and let us not be mad at temptation, but look at it in a good light, that it, every time that I defeat you, Satan, I'm going to be stronger, and I'm going to be closer to the Lord. So it's a good thing, you know, and for the Christian to be able to have temptation so that we have opportunities on a regular basis to serve you and to live for you and to become stronger. So we just love you today. We thank you and ask this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.